A report by the Global Center on Adaptation reveals that Africa is facing a critical shortfall in funding for climate adaptation. The report, which was launched today, stresses the need for incre an increase in climate adaptation finance to Africa. Professor Patrick Verkuyen, CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation, joins me to comment on the findings from the report. Professor, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, here from Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt, indeed. Right. Great to have you. Let's get right to it. Uh, you have put out the Global Center on Adaptation has put out a report on uh, adaptation financing for Africa. And uh, but let's start from where the report says that cumulative adaptation finance to from now, I, I suppose, up until the year 2030 will come to less than one quarter of the estimated needs stated by African countries in their national determined contributions, unless more funding for climate adapt adaptation is secured. Obviously, this is going to be on the front burner for African nations at COP27 uh, today. And, uh, but just walk us through this report. Why, what, what are some of the biggest challenges or barriers to financing, particularly from the private sector? Well, so the, so the big challenge is this. Africa, I mean, all regions in the world are impacted by, by the climate emergency, uh, of course. But there's one continent which is particularly impacted disproportionately, which is Africa. I mean, nine out of the 10 most vulnerable nations in the world happen to be in Africa, a continent which only itself contributed less than 3% of greenhouse gas emissions. So the story is very simple. Africa didn't cause the climate crisis but it's suffering from it. So there's a profound moral injustice in the system. So African leaders have said last year, during the previous climate summit in Glasgow, enough is enough. Money has to flow to the continent to address this injustice. And they have put a plan on the table, the so-called Africa Adaptation Acceleration Program. What is it? It is an investment plan, $25 billion over five years for food security, resilient infrastructure, youth and jobs, and finance. Is that enough? Well, we found in our report that the financing needs for Africa as a whole on an annual basis is how much? $51 billion. How much is flowing today to Africa for this agenda? Just $11 billion. So there is an annual shortfall of 40, 40 billion US dollars growing deficit on the continent. So in the next few days here in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, global leaders are coming together. The COP27 summit is coined the Africa Summit. So Africa leaders say, you know what? Africa challenges and priorities are in adaptation. We've seen it in the Horn of Africa. I mean, it's, it's suffering the worst drought in 40 years. We've seen it in West Africa. I mean, Senegal, to take an example is losing 10% of GDP on an annual basis because of the floods. This injustice needs to stop, and the plan which is being put on the table needs to be capitalized. So African leaders are very sort of determined that the Western leaders will come through. We'll, we'll talk about Western leaders in a, in a moment. But of that figure that you announced previously, 11.4 billion uh, that came in between 2019 and 2020, it says that uh, this was more than 97% of the funds uh, came from public actors, while less than 3% came from the private sector. Help us understand why the pri we're seeing this very low percentage from the private sector. What, what, how can we unlock more from this category? Well, a first proposition is this. I mean, there's never enough government money to fill the sort of the financing gap of $40 billion a year, right? I mean. Simply that, that public expenditure is not, is not there, neither in Africa nor in the international community. Hence, the private sector needs to step up. But the private sector needs predictability. The private sector needs a return on investments. The private sector needs to be incentivized to invest in climate adaptation, as they are on the mitigation side. I mean, it's very um, sort of simple for a private sector entity to invest, say, in solar power plants. It's quite difficult to invest in climate adaptation. Why? Because the return on their investments is much less direct. But the point is this, 
investing in climate adaptation. As I said, in agriculture in or in building resilient roads has a very high return on investments. This is simply smart economics. So what we try to get out of this climate summit here in Sharm el-Sheikh is basically the context that money will flow in the years to come. Because quite frankly, for Africa, the, the story is very um, stark. It's either adapt or die. So that's quite frankly not really a choice, is it? Mm, yeah. Now, the UN Secretary, Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, uh, in a run-up to COP27, uh, did say, and that was also in your report, she said COP27 must be a turning point and developed countries must put forward a credible plan to double adaptation finance to reach 40 billion. But you say Africa needs around 51 billion uh, every year up until 2030. She also calls for a new business model to deliver adaptation finance by turning adaptation priorities into pipelines of investment for projects. Would that be for the private sector? How does this work? Could you just share, give, uh, help us understand this uh, better? Yes, yeah, so there are a couple of issues here on the finance side for adaptation. One, I mean, there is money in the global system. Take the Green Climate Fund, the largest climate fund in the world. How much money of, of, of the Green Climate Fund is flowing to, to Africa? Very little. How much money is going to Africa on adaptation? Even less so. And why is that? Because African financial institutions find it very difficult to get accredited to these type of institutions and get the proposals on the table. So that's why we are so keen to support African financial institutions to get fit for purpose, get finance flowing. Separately, I mean, there are examples um, uh, abound, say in, in, in Ivory Coast, they're issuing a bond, um, a two billion euro bond on the international capital markets, basically on green finance but not so much on the adaptation side of things. So I think there are different innovative solutions out there which will, at the end, need to increase the flow of finance. Now, with COP27 underway, let's talk about expectations. Uh, obviously, for Africa, it's going to be adaptation and getting that much-needed adaptation finance. What are your expectations? What can we expect from the from private sector, those who will be attending governments, especially on uh, the Western side? in terms of support and how Africa can scale to get the fi much needed financing for this adaptation? Well, my expectation is, is, is twofold. One, as you referenced, last year in Glasgow, the Western world promised to double adaptation finance in the coming few years. Uh, the beginning of that finance doubling needs to come through here in, uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. In fact, tomorrow, President Macky Sall, President, of course, of Senegal, but in his capacity, as chairperson of the African Union, brings together global leaders, heads of state and government, to have a sort of investors round table to get these resources on the table. My expectation is that the beginning of that financing flow is confirmed tomorrow. Is it enough to address the crisis of uh, the day after tomorrow? No, but I mean, it is a start, I hope, for sort of a transformation in financing flow, because quite frankly, there's a very simple choice to make the world either delays and pays or it plans and prospers. So I think that's basically the bottom line what COP27 has to deliver, not just for Africa, but for the world. Uh, you know, some might argue that bottom line could also be, you know, we just keep our fingers crossed and be hopeful. It won't be the first time we're trying to get, we'll be trying to get uh, Western leaders to make a bigger commitment to uh, adaptation financing especially. And it's, you know, we. The promises are not met. Not that they're not doing anything, but you know the numbers continue to fall short. So, what are the assurances that things will be different this time? That's why I said some might argue that we can only hope and be optimistic because we could. We actually do run the risk of coming back here uh, next year or the next event, and you know you and I will be having this same conversation about how you know these leaders need to do more and need to make a bigger commitment. But you know we can only hope. What are your thoughts on that? Well. My thought is this, I mean, we don't need new commitments, new promises, new this, then, the other. We need old commitments to be delivered. I mean, this is about delivery here. This is about trust. This is about solidarity. This is about keeping you know, to your promises in, in a serious manner. I mean, last year, they could get away with it of not delivering the funding which was required already last year. And the, the, the argument Western leaders said, well, actually, we're willing to plan to finance 
um, Africa adaptation revolution, but where is your investment plan? Well, in fact, the investment plan is there. The investment plan is on the table. African heads of state and government have already put some initial funding behind it. It is working. It is sort of ready for, for, for scaling up. So tomorrow is going to be a very important moment uh, for the continent for basically non-African heads of state to come through. My expectations is that certain uh, leaders will uh, financially uh, commit, but this is also a rallying cry for other leaders to follow through on what they promised last year. So I agree with you, we should not have these climate summits with new promises and next year we have promises on the promises. No, delivery, delivery, delivery. That's the art of the game this week.